There's a feeling you get when playing an especially captivating video game. That feeling of being completely immersed, of not wanting to let go, or wanting to simply come back once you've left. It's that sense of wanting to explore every nook and cranny, of needing to accomplish some lofty goal, and see yourself become something more than what you began as. Especially is this a fact for the best type of strategy games. Those where you begin knowing nothing, have a hard time, but slowly understand more and more until finally something clicks. Some grand mystery has unraveled, and numbers go from red to green, or some unassailable challenge has just become solvable. I've spent thousands of hours in Paradox games, and my favorite one has probably been EU4. But only with Crusader Kings 2, that first Paradox deep dive of mine, did I experience that true, unfiltered sense of obsession, of needing to come back and learn more, understand more, and do better. That is, until now. Victoria 3 is a grand strategy masterpiece, plain and simple. No, it's not without its faults or shortcomings, but it's a marvel of strategy, not just in the grand political map painting sense, but also in the addicting, good old capitalist imperialist ethos way of beginning somewhere and ending up someplace completely different, hopefully somewhere better than where you started. Arguably more than any other Paradox game, Victoria 3 is impossibly complex, mysterious, and all-encompassing. At the same time, it manages to be one of the most alluring grand strategy games I've ever played, owe to its sheer depth, massive amount of content, a sea of ways to play, and its way of keeping me hooked after more than 100 hours of game time in a matter of days. And now you're probably wondering why I'm giving this game so much praise before I've even discussed it. And well, my answer is simple. Because I'm so hyped to finally be able to tell you about the game I've been playing and enjoying all by myself for way too long right now. There's just so much to deal with here. So let's just begin at the beginning. Victoria 3 is the latest grand strategy game from Paradox Development Studios, and you might know them first and foremost from the amazing Imperator Rome. But unlike Imperator, Victoria 3 takes place in the long 19th century, although it here begins in 1836 and ends in 1936. An entire century of imperial struggle, trade, innovation, oppression and liberation, a few revolutions here and there, civil wars, and even a world war. It's a time of changing ideas, of old traditions falling by the wayside, and the forging of the most powerful empires in all of history. But more than all of this, Victoria 3 does something incredible. It somehow manages to mix that addicting grand strategy empire forging feeling with a focus on economic and political simulation other games are entirely dedicated to. In a way, Victoria 3 is the perfect mix between Europa Universalis 4 and Anno 1800, all the while being quite unlike either of them on the surface. And here's why. Absolutely everything in Victoria 3 is interconnected. Countries in strategy games are mostly connected through conquest or vassalization, and this certainly remains true here as well. Expansion is as good a way as ever to bolster your economic power and demand respect, and seeing your color expand across the map is as satisfying and vital as it's ever been. However, Warfare and subjugation is no longer the only way to do so. You see, the arguably most quintessential aspect of Victoria 3 is the market. Here, not only are factions divided by their country tag, but every country is further a part of a unique market, either their own or someone else's. The market is where every good produced in the game is bought and sold, and the market determines which goods you're able to take advantage of, both for production but also for the needs of your population. Of course, this means there is an entire world of gameplay underneath those beautiful colors on the world map. In Victoria 3, your country is divided into states, and each state is its own little ecosystem. This is where your cities grow, your economy is forged, and where your people go through their entire lives. So much more than any other strategic map is this a living one, as almost everything you do or don't do is reflected here. In the beginning, trade will be mostly drawn by horse and carriage, while later, great steel trains will dominate the roads now covered by railways. Ships will go from being driven by wind to driven by steam, and soon, cities will go from looking positively medieval to looking much more industrial. This development is obviously driven by everything you do in the game's UI, 
the dozens of various menus and windows hidden beneath the ever-present icons and symbols on each side of the screen. The things most recognizable in Victoria 3 are arguably the concepts, although they function differently than in other games. Like EU4, Victoria 3 uses mana points, or capacities as the game calls them, to symbolize various aspects of your state. These are bureaucracy, authority, influence, and money, if we want to call that mana. While bureaucracy points allows you to keep both taxation and trade routes flowing, authority allows you to deal out special consumption taxes on goods, enact decrees in your states, or influence the standing of political interest groups. Influence, on the other hand, governs your diplomatic power, meaning your ability to make alliances and trade agreements. And finally, money allows you to pay for the raising of new buildings, the running of your government, the military, and the wages therein. Everything you do in Victoria 3 in one way or another involves making these numbers go up, which inherently makes it more likely that you will stay an independent nation, and perhaps even a hegemonic one. I've generally never had a problem with point systems like these in Paradox games, actually I find them fun and addicting when done right, and if there's something Victoria 3 does right, it's making you want to play more in order to increase them, as the green numbers generally are a sign of your prosperity. But what makes this system of numbers even more interesting and positively revolutionary is that they demand that you optimize your use of them by a very real mechanic. Whereas in other games where making more and more money for the sake of having a never-ending piggy bank is a real way to play, Victoria 3 actually punishes you for not spending your money. As you can see, each capacity has a bar underneath it. These can either be green, or gold in money's case, or red, meaning that you're either gaining capacity or losing it. This bar is essentially your bank of resources relative to its max capacity. In the case of gold, the big number on top only details how much you're making on any given week. The arguably more important number is the one represented by the bar, meaning how much gold you have in reserve, or indeed how much loans you have accrued. The addicting thing about this is that you actually have a set limit on how much gold you can keep in your reserve before you'll experience diminishing returns, which essentially means tossing away money. This limit is always said to be a certain fraction of your total GDP, but can be increased with technology as well. This balancing act is just one way Victoria 3 forces you to prioritize in different ways, and it somehow makes making money, and these other capacities, an even more interesting and multifaceted minigame all on its own. What the capacities are there for is naturally to allow you to develop your country, and that is done by raising buildings. Everything in Victoria 3 comes from buildings, whether the daily grain or the cannons needed for warfare. But the vital thing in Victoria 3 is that every building produces something, but this also comes at the cost of consuming something. Not only that, while you're the one having to pay for the factories to be built, the money coming in is only based on the tax revenue of said building, at least for most systems. And for the factory to send you taxes, it must be profitable. This means that goods produced and the goods consumed cost money and have their own value on the market. In other words, the market balance of the goods purchased by the factory must be favorable if the factory is to make a profit. Now imagine that there are over 50 different types of goods in this game, and each can and will be bought and sold on the market. You are in charge of building the buildings, and they tell you exactly how much they will produce and consume at every level, including how many people they employ. However, your state has laws, and these determine who runs your factories. So while you are in charge of construction, it is the owners, whether merchant guilds or capitalists, who are in charge of actually running them. They buy and sell the goods required by the factory, and hire workers when they can afford to. The bigger the profit, the more people are hired and getting paid, and the better the effects on your economy and overall standard of living. However, while making a profit is all well and good, these business owners don't really know how to plan for the future. If your market is unbalanced and losing money for a while, they will lay off people as soon as they can, meaning people get angry and radical, and might become a problem for the well-being of your state later on. This means that it's up to you to make sure the factory you're building is actually needed, as ending up in a spiral of hiring and firing is arguably the worst thing that can happen. In fact, this is one of my biggest complaints about Victoria 3. I wish business owners were smarter. That spiral of hiring and firing is indeed very real, and can only be undone by profit or downscaling, but either one of these may have dramatic effects elsewhere. 
This is why I wish business owners would refrain from automatically upscaling production every week if they can, because doing so might mean they have to downscale again in the next one. I'm missing a hiring freeze mechanic for added sustainability here, where a business would stop hiring people as long as they operated at a profit, if hiring more people meant that the production good would lose its value enough to make the business operate at a loss. Of course, this is all a part of the game, part of you learning which buildings are necessary to build, and which ones are not. It becomes easier if you're playing an economy of scale, as this also often gives you the wiggle room to make use of extensive trade, the other aspect of the market in Victoria 3, which governs imports and exports. Just like in the real world, what you can't produce yourself, you kind of have to import. At the same time, if you're making too much of a good, it might be time to consider sending it abroad for profit. It's again a balancing act alongside production, as importing and exporting will influence the price of any good you might be producing or consuming. In addition, both of these market aspects are made possible by two mechanics. In order to build anything, you need not just money to pay for the materials, but just as importantly, you need construction points. Think of construction points as civilian factories in Hearts of Iron 4. They are essentially the combined might of your construction sector, meaning how fast and how many buildings you can raise at any given time. Generally, the larger the country, the more construction points and the more money it has, meaning it's able to build exponentially more than the smaller factions. Each building demands a set number of construction before it finishes, so as always, it's vital to plan ahead and understand your needs now and what they might be in the future. In the same vein, trade routes which allow you to bypass buildings in order to attain resources demand the bureaucracy capacity to establish. Once more, larger factions tend to have more of these because they also have and can afford the upkeep of more government administration buildings, which produces bureaucracy. If you know anything about Paradox games, it's that things take time, and depending on your country, it's not constant action at every tick of the week or month. I will say that perhaps Victoria 3 overdid it slightly this time though. Even though the construction time of buildings is more reasonable for larger factions, it feels much too long for those with the minimum amount of construction points, numbered at 5. This means it's often going to take you an entire year to simply raise one industry type building, like the crucial iron mines, meaning an entire percent of the game's time span will be over before it's done. Raising the construction sector point is admittedly easy in itself and takes less time, but going over the minimum number of 5 will also exponentially raise the cost of construction. Everything is a balancing act in Victoria 3, and for the vast majority of cases, it's designed mostly flawlessly. But right here, I do wish minor factions received a boost to construction speed, in addition to the benefit they have at the moment, namely that constructing buildings is free with only 5 construction sectors. In terms of the market then, Victoria 3 is more than anything a game about balancing your budget, about planning ahead and setting up an economic powerhouse of scale, and using that power to assert your influence around the world. Of course, everything I've just said is further influenced by who's in charge, and which rules you play by. You have heard me talking about laws and populations in this video, and that's because Victoria 3 is more than just supply and demand. Indeed, Victoria 3 is a classic paradox title in the sense that you assume the control of the spirit of the nation, but here, it's arguably more complex than ever. Every country is run by a faction leader, whether a king or president, but is also governed by a national assembly. These assemblies are occupied by interest groups, and they all have their own needs, likes and dislikes, and will both reward and punish depending on your actions. The interest groups are the ones not only determining which laws become available for you to enact, but also how likely they are to pass. Laws determine everything you do in Victoria 3, from which buildings you are allowed to subsidize, to which and how much pops are taxed, to the size of your army, whether women and children can work, and much more. Of course, modernizing your country is not necessarily easy. Not only does every interest group have a share of their power, which increases or decreases based on laws and populations, but these groups also have an approval rating of the job the government is doing. This means that if you're trying to modernize too fast, or failing to modernize or change at all, varying parties might be radicalized and even positively revolutionary. The bonuses awarded from new laws are dependent on your situation, however, meaning whereas a state like Prussia is quite modernized in terms of the well-being of the state, the Ottomans are devastatingly decadent, lacking a real army, 
a real taxation system, and proper education. Of course, they're also severely limited by the powerful landowners, the largest interest group in the empire. Things are so bad that it even begins with the sick man of Europe trait and mission, demanding that you modernize and urbanize within just 20 years, unless you wish to become the dead man of Europe. In other words, while modernizing quickly for the Ottoman Empire is a matter of life and death, doing so for the United States can be detrimental. At the beginning of the game, the US government is in a bind between the slavers and abolitionists, and any movement on this law might cause a civil war. Honestly, this system of laws is one of my most favorite aspects of Victoria 3, not just because they're infinitely interesting and can take your country in any direction you attempt to take it in, but also because they say something about the state of the world in the 19th century. It is, for example, a testament to the decadence and backwardness of the United States and the Ottoman Empire that they are the only great powers where slavery is legal. In the same vein, Austria is basing its cultural policies on the supremacy of the German nation, making it harder to coexist with its many national minorities. France accepts any culture as long as it shares its European heritage or French language, and despite being a monarchy, allows every man of a certain financial stature to vote in the National Assembly. More than any other then, the laws and institution system, where the latter says something about your investment into civilian institutions like education and welfare, are reminders of the historical differences between countries and cultures, and perhaps even some of the legacies that still linger today. I must admit it's really cool to see Norway's political standing in 1836, with census suffrage, freedom of conscience, right of assembly, and propertied women already enacted, making it one of the most politically modernized countries in the world. Kind of useful knowledge if you ever wanted to play as a minor power with exciting potential. Of course, your journey through the 19th century is one of international diplomacy, not just what's going on domestically. As with the game's other mechanics, we now have menus down below called lenses, and by in this case opening the diplomatic lens, we may begin to conduct diplomacy. The beauty of diplomacy is that it can make things easier for you. A trade agreement between two nations removes not only tariffs on goods, but also the bureaucracy costs for trade routes. Similarly, if you suffer from a massive shortage of goods, it can be smart to join a larger country's internal market until you've made some headway. The beauty of diplomatic treaties is that they can always be cancelled, but do be aware that doing so lessens the relations between you. It's only possible to conduct diplomacy, though, with neighbors or countries within your active strategic regions. An interesting replacement for diplomatic range. So far, so good. But perhaps the most revolutionary part of diplomacy in Victoria 3 is that of diplomatic place. It's no longer possible to simply go to war in Victoria 3. For that, you have to begin a diplomatic play against another country. Diplomatic plays are essentially the lead-up to war but are much more complicated than, for example, simply posturing in Hearts of Iron. Conflicts that may end in war actually go through several stages. The first deals with establishing what the conflict is about, allowing countries to spend maneuver points to make more demands of the other. The second phase deals with diplomacy, and this is where things get interesting. In this phase, other countries may join the side of either party, even without being diplomatically tied to them already. This is where strategic interest becomes important, as you may only partake in diplomatic plays in regions of strategic interest to you. The third and final phase is the countdown to war. This is when hostilities can break out for real, or one of the parties may actually back down, allowing for a peaceful solution. In a case like this, only the primary war goal of the other party is accepted, and sparing innocent lives in the process. I find diplomatic plays to be fascinating and revolutionary in terms of gameplay, as it really adds so much more depth to diplomacy. However, it also means one thing. War should clearly be your second priority. I say this because in a world where great powers can join most of the wars, expansion can be difficult, especially compared to the massive war campaigns of CK2 and EU4. As a minor power, you're therefore extremely dependent on being on good terms with the greats, waging wars in regions and against countries they have no interest in, or fight countries they have bad relations with. I do think it's a fun system overall, and most importantly, it really works for a time period where coalitions and the balance of power were constantly on the agenda. Just don't expect to be conquering lands left and right all over Europe. However, that is what other systems are for. The flavor of Victoria 3 adds that extra layer of depth. As to Sicily's and Prussia, for example, 
is possible to forge new countries entirely simply by being a diplomatic genius. By raising relations and sharing the same market, Italian or German states may choose to give up their sovereignty to join your nation-building project. Although I will say it feels a bit too easy at the moment. Alternatively, we always have those more alternative history paths, like forging Scandinavia or indeed the Byzantine Empire. Now, if only we could get a European Union formable nation, everything would be fine and dandy. And if you say that's ahistorical, well, good sir, I say to you that the idea of a pan-European state was introduced in 1923, well within the time frame of this game as opposed to the Byzantine Empire or fictional Scandinavia. Just do it, Paradox, and allow every European country with European heritage cultures to form it as long as they control enough European states, or better, have enough European countries within the same market. Simple. Oh, and call the achievement Europa Universalis. Thank you, please. And speaking of states, Victoria 3 is a game of power and prestige. Indeed, every country seeks a place in the sun, and the sunniest of them all are the great powers, those whose might and prestige place them above all others. The great powers have more influence to spend on diplomacy, can activate more strategic regions at the same time, and more. Your prestige level, influenced first and foremost by your economic, military, and naval power, determine your rank. And so, it's often that the larger and more powerful your nation, the more prestige it has. In Victoria 3, however, there's more to rank than just prestige. This world is divided into powers of various ranks. We have great powers and major powers on the top, and these are the most likely to either remain or one day reach that great power status. On the opposite end, we have fully decentralized powers, those countries that are without even basic state systems. These remain open for colonization by others, which in this game is its own institution. But then we have the case of the unrecognized powers. These are the countries which might be big and powerful, but which are not yet recognized as worthy of a spot among the big boys and girls. Great Qing, for example, is a massive and powerful country, yet unrecognized by the European great powers because of its outdated technology and non-European culture. If you want to be recognized, however, China has to win a diplomatic play against a great power. Think of the Russo-Japanese War, where Japan won a war against great power Russia and became a recognized great power itself. It's once again an immersive system that details how far you've climbed on the ladder of prestige, and it's just as fun to play the rat race as a smaller nation as it is to begin at the top and attempt to remain there. In Victoria 3, there's no cap for how many great powers there can be, it's all dependent on your prestige and how much you have compared to the rest of the world. This change makes the game even more sandboxy, and I really love that. Especially because racing prestige can also be gained by being a nation of culture and art, not just war. And speaking of war, warfare is completely different in Victoria 3, and it's like nothing you've ever seen before, for better or worse. Victoria 3 completely ditches the controlling of armies, removing what's been a core pillar of Paradox games. Instead, this micromanaged system is replaced by a top-down approach. Now, everything you have to decide is which troops to use and which technology to outfit them with, which generals you employ, and finally, where you place them in the world. The world of Victoria 3's military is divided into HQs, essentially regions governed by various generals. In a war, these generals can then be placed on fronts, asked to either advance or defend them, and similarly, navies can be commanded to patrol coastlines or prepare naval invasions. But that's kind of where this whole thing ends. Unlike in Hearts of Iron 4, where you are in charge of making tactics and strategies, all of this is gone, replaced by AI-fought battles which move the front line in either direction. Battles may be followed by clicking on the icons on the map, but there's nothing you can do to change their outcome once they begin. Frankly, there's little you can do at all once a war has begun, other than assigning to front lines, of course, but in many cases there's not that many of those. Wars and battles are symbolized by a burning front line between the countries, and some very simple animations of cannon fire once a battle begins. My favorite animation is the scorched earth after devastation from war has occurred, really showing us where the intense battles have been fought. But that's kind of where it stops. Now, even though I find the front line system to be very interesting in concept, and while I love preparing my military for war, I really wish the system was a lot more than what it currently is. Honestly, while I think Hearts of Iron 4 has an incredible warfare system, my biggest gripe with that game is probably that it becomes too intense and all-encompassing over time, first and foremost because the wars never end. 
but in Victoria 3, this is not the case at all. Wars are in fact generally quite short. That's why I'm devastated that Paradox chose to not just copy, paste and modify the Hearts of Iron system over here, as a fun battle minigame with deep tactical abilities, with wars actually ending relatively soon, would have been perfect. Like I genuinely want there to be so much more here, so desperately, that just thinking of personally moving my front line, making tactics and seeing them succeed, makes me happy. And then I get sad when I realize it's not in the game. The game doesn't even have proper animations for battles, which would have actually made a big difference. Literally all we have are cannons on a fort firing with generic sounds every few seconds until the battle is over. There are no troop movements here, no sounds of armies, nothing. On the seas, naval battles are stale looking, and similarly could have been made to at least look like so much more. In fact, I think that while the land battles could have been given a Hearts of Iron 4 system, the naval system could remain as is, although with much improved animations, so that it actually looks like there's a general conflict occurring at sea as well. Since we don't have to worry about air, including a simplified naval system, such a warfare mechanic would have been perfectly fine for the player to manage and I think it would have added a massive amount of fun and tactical potential to the game. In essence then, while the general managing and preparation of your military is exciting, the actual warfare itself, what's happening on the battlefield and how it looks, is the worst I've ever seen in a Paradox game, and I desperately wish for the first expansion to indeed expand and revamp warfare. Because despite Victory 3 being mostly about country management, wars actually happen quite often and for such a staple of this franchise and games to be relegated so much to behind the scenes is a massive shame in my eyes. Now underneath all of this is the very thing that allows for the running of your businesses and the fighting of your wars, the population. The population of your country determines everything in Victoria 3. And if you think I've said something similar before, well that's because Victoria 3 is so finely tuned and interconnected. Your population is made out of pops, essentially groups of individuals who work in the same profession, and share the same culture. Pops determine how many people your buildings can employ, how large your army is, and their literacy, qualification level, and citizenship govern which professions they can enter. Whatever you build and trade in Victoria 3 ultimately affects the prices of goods, and Pops actually purchase goods to stay alive. The price of the goods consumed by Pops directly impact the standard of living in your country, as cheaper consumer goods mean more people can afford them, and more production similarly means more people have an income. I think the population system is one of the most complicated aspects of Victoria 3 because there are so many different pops and varieties of people to pay attention to. At the same time, it's arguably the least pressing aspect of the game. What I mean by this is that you don't necessarily have to understand everything about population to get going, as it largely just works in the background. Unless of course you're a vast multicultural nation where paying attention to deeper needs and discrimination becomes important. All in all then, I think it's a really good system as it works well, and the more you know about it, the easier it is to manipulate. As I hope is evident, Victoria 3 is a massively complicated game with deep and multifaceted mechanics, and I absolutely love the vast majority of them. However, there are some things that I feel are missing. First of all, the map modes in this game are severely lacking. I really want to be able to have a political overlay map at all times, even at the lowest level, and to have it look really good as well. I want a proper dedicated diplomatic map mode where the map shows us the official relationship between certain countries, like alliances and trade agreements, not just attitudes and likability. Further, I just can't understand why the map remains white when clicking on a current war, as the map here ought to be displaying and coloring in the fighting countries. Similarly, a dedicated resource map is lacking where it just displays every discovered resource in a region, and I want a map mode that displays terrain and combat with since these are largely hidden factors in Victoria 3, despite having an impact on your battles. A map showing just the player country would also be nice. I have a lot of complaints about map modes then, as I find Paradox's trend towards minimizing information given to the player is highly regrettable and nonsensical, especially in a highly complex game like this one. I'd also like a dedicated screen where it's possible to see every trade relation you have with one specific country, not just a generic trade route screen with all the routes. This is because choosing trade agreements is a matter of giving up tariffs and opening your market to another, so it's vital to understand which resources you might already be trading, or indeed needing. Further, 
I find the country leader portraits and the general 3D graphics of the characters to be rather immersion-breaking, particularly because they can look goofy and often similar to each other. I wish these were represented by paintings or artworks instead, as I find these to just kind of look weird. Especially children just look possessed, and I have no idea what the hell is going on here. On the flip side, I love that Wiki 3 finally allows us to enable achievements without forcing us to match the game's checksum, meaning it's actually possible, finally, to gather achievements while using mods. This is such a big quality of life change that I can't express my joy when realizing it. I've already modded the color of the Ottoman Empire to be red, instead of the game's green default color. I'm also a big fan of the game's tutorial and more guided campaign styles if you wish to enable them, as they're very good at setting a path for the player. Victoria 3 is a masterpiece of grand strategy. Despite sharing many concepts, if you thought Vicky 3 would be anything like Vicky 2, you're wrong. Vicky 3 takes much of its inspiration from previous Paradox games, but doubles down on virtually every aspect. I'd perhaps even go so far as to say that the only thing remaining from Victoria 2 here is the setting and the main concept of enterprise and societal shift. But to be honest, I've enjoyed Vicky 3 more than I ever did Vicky 2. In fact, Victoria 3, in my opinion, combines many of the best aspects of both Victoria 2, EU4, and Imperator Rome, whether it's the trade and resource system, addictive capacity mechanics, and an exciting setting with a focus on country management and nation building. I've played Victoria 3 more than any other game before actually reviewing it for launch, and I kid you not when I say I've never once felt bored, too angry to go on, or as if something was too frustrating to look past. Victoria 3 has genuinely made me feel like an excited child running back to this game to continue playing, and getting more and more immersed and hyped as various mechanics all of a sudden just click. This is likely going to be the most complex strategy game you've ever played, and it's going to take you dozens or hundreds of hours of gameplay to fully understand all of it. But once you do, even before that happens actually, Victoria 3 offers a strategy experience like no other, and despite a few shortcomings which I hope will be remedied in the future, like Warfare, a strategy game like this only releases about once or twice every decade, and when the launch version of Victoria 3 is as fantastic and addicting as it is right now, I just know that this game is going to have an amazing future. Thank you so much for watching. You have no idea how excited I am for all of you to get your hands on this and for Victoria 3 to blossom and grow not only with expansions, but also with the massive potential of mods. I really hope you enjoyed this video and that you leave a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. I'd also really appreciate if you consider becoming a YouTube member or a patron, as your support allows me to keep making videos just like this one. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.